In this video, we're looking at the beginning of chapter 2 of this glorious letter of 1 Timothy. Uh, we've seen Paul reminding Timothy as the pastor of the church in Ephesus, he's urged him, commanded him to stop the false teachers, to keep the focus of this church on the glorious gospel of salvation through our Lord Jesus. And in this passage, he, we get to the heart of the letter, which we'll look at in a moment. If you haven't yet read the passage a number of times, then I do just encourage you to stop the video and read through this passage a few times just to familiarize yourself with what's in the passage and then take some time to pray. Paul starts this passage by saying, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people. And that principle is important when coming to God's word, that we are prayerfully dependent as we come to this word, that God by his spirit would help us to understand it. So please take some time to read and to pray and I'm just going to show some of what I've seen in this passage that I hope will be helpful to you as you dig in and as you teach this to others. I called the sermon I preached on this section What God Wants. And that sermon title comes from uh, this, these verses at the heart of this section and I would contend that these verses are at the heart of the whole of 1 Timothy. One of the most helpful tools that I've found just to help me dig into 1 Timothy are some lectures that a man called Dick Lucas gave back in the 1980s. Uh, you can find those on the Proclamation Trust website. If you go there, look for 1 Timothy, look for Dick Lucas and look for the lectures he gave in 1988, 1989. They are really helpful just to get into this book. And Dick Lucas very helpfully shows how uh, what many people call, they say Timothy is about uh, church order, and they look at chapter 3, uh, these verses, and they say this is Timothy's purpose statement, I'm writing these things so that if I'm delayed, you'll know how you ought to conduct yourselves in God's household. And so then they take this as a letter all about church order, how to structure ourselves, now, although there is church order and structure in this letter, it's far less bland than just a letter about church order. And the thing that really is at the heart of this letter from beginning to end is salvation. God, our Savior, wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So in some ways, you could say it is about church order in that it is wanting us to structure ourselves in such a way that this glorious message of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ is kept front and center in everything that we do as a church. So I do commend those talks by Dick Lucas. They aren't sermons, they are lectures um, on, on this letter. I think Dick Lucas is uh, one of the great gifts to our church in this age. Um, he is an older Christian man now who is still digging into God's word and teaching other ministers how to faithfully uh, handle God's truth. So go find those and dig into them for yourself. And so this truth that God our Savior wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth really is at the heart of this letter. And so that is where I'm going to keep coming back to in these videos just to remind us of the central point and show how Paul keeps coming back to this uh, gospel truth over and over throughout the letter. And this passage really does revolve around those verses. So it is worth just getting our heads around verse 3 and 4. You can add into this uh, verse 5 and 6 which uh, flesh out, give us further truth about this God who saves. A key repetition that's worth just highlighting is this idea of all people, um, all those in authority. God our Savior wants all people to be saved. And Christ gave himself as a ransom for all people. You can add mankind in this. He stands, Christ stands between God and mankind and all people. And what is it that God wants? Well, he wants all people to be saved. Now, this passage can lead into a conversation about universalism. 
if God wants all people to be saved, then God will get what he wants and all people will be saved. Now, that's not what Paul is saying in this section. God does want all people to be saved. But like we saw in last week's passage, uh, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. But that salvation is effective for those who would believe in him. And this idea of, of faith is a big thing, unbelief or belief. And those who believe in him receive eternal life. They are saved by Jesus and return, you receive that eternal life. So you cannot back up universalism from this letter. But yes, God does want all people to be saved. And this then should impact the way that we live as God's saved people. So Paul says, I urge then, first of all, so our first important, this is a priority. And then he speaks about prayer. These four words, uh, petitions, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving, they are all different terms for prayer. Paul wants prayer to be the frontline evangelistic tool. And if you go and look at Ephesians 6, uh, verse 18 to 20, you'll see that this was something that Paul um, had spoken to this Ephesian church about before. And what he's saying here, with using four different words for prayer, he's saying Offer all sorts of prayers for all sorts of people, but it's for ultimately the salvation of those people. So we should be praying that all people will be saved. And then he speaks about praying for kings and those in authority. And again, I think Paul's the heart that Paul wants you to see in this is that if God our Savior wants all people to be saved, those in authority are linked with that. Um, we should want to see people saved. And so this truth that Jesus saves impacts the way that we pray for all people, including those in positions of power and those in authority. We should want all of them to come to know the salvation that Christ Jesus came into the world to win for us. Another repeated idea in this is just this idea of truth. Where Paul speaks here. Um, I'm telling the truth. He's defending the, the false teachers who are coming in and spreading lies and controversies where he's saying, no, I'm telling you the truth. And it's, he wants people to come to know this truth, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then the end of this uh, verse 7, I think a, a more helpful way to translate it. Uh, it is a difficult phrase in the Greek, and if you go and look at different translations, there's multiple translations. But I think from the context, uh, one of the more helpful uh, ways of translating this would be that where he says, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, and I am a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And a teacher... So just contextually that the way of translating uh, seems to, to fit well with what Paul is talking about in this section. And so truth is very important. And it's this truth that we saw in chapter 1, verse 15, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It's this truth that God wants all people to be saved that should then inform the way that we pray. So we should be praying truth-shaped prayers, prayers for the salvation of all people, for kings and those in authority. But then the end of verse 2 so many read it just directly linked with praying for those in authority. And they say, well, if we're praying for the kings, that, that actually they rule in a way that is good, that will make our lives peaceful and quiet and all goodliness, good godliness and holiness. Another way to read the verses when he says, I pray, uh, urge, urge then first of all that these prayers be made. The prayers are made for all people. The prayers are made for kings. And then the prayers are made that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. And I think it's a helpful way to look at this passage where he's saying we should be living truth-shaped lives. The truth about Jesus should impact the way that we live so that the world will see and they'll want to know what's made the difference. And this is an idea that is picked up in a number of Paul's letters. If you go and read 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, from verse 10 onwards, um, or you go and read uh, Romans 12, or 1 Peter 2. Obviously, that's not Paul, but that's Peter also talking about the way we live that will be an example to those looking in. 
Uh, so the way we live should commend the gospel to others. And I think that's what Paul is talking about here. Pray that our lives will be peaceful and quiet. Now, that's not saying that we never make a noise, that we um, are silent. Uh, the quiet lives, peaceful lives are lives that commend the gospel to others. And actually, uh, that helps us in our understanding of next week's passage, which is a massively contentious passage, uh, but we'll be trying to carefully dig into it in the next video. Um, but here he's saying the way you live, peaceful, quiet lives in godliness and holiness. Um, again, a better translation of that word might be in dignity. So live in a way that uh, outsiders looking in see that the gospel of salvation through Jesus has made a significant impact in your life. So live or pray truth-shaped prayers, live truth-shaped lives. And at the end, he's going to talk about uh, speaking this truth, truth-shaped words. Uh, but before he gets there, he's got uh, four, uh, so a linking word. They're always worth looking out for linking words like that. So he's got a linking word there as well. And this four, he expands. So God, our Savior, wants all people to be saved, come to a knowledge of the truth. Four there is one God. And if there is only one God, it's the truth about him and salvation through him that people need to know. And there is only one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. There's only one person who can stand between us and God and plead our case. Jesus is that one. And so he's the one we should be pointing to Again, just thinking of Isaiah where he's, God says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. There is only one God and only that God can then save. And he saves through Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all people. A ransom, the price was paid to deal with our sin. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, chapter 1 verse 15. And the ransom price to pay for that sin was paid by Jesus. And this has now been witnessed to at the proper time. So this glorious news of salvation through Jesus has now been made known. And then he says, and for this purpose. So flowing all of the out of all of this, he gives what is his purpose. So God wants all people to be saved. And because all of this, these gospel truths are true, he says, and for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul's whole life goal was to point people to this truth, that God wants people to be saved and that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he was appointed a herald, so somebody who speaks this word out, an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And it's very important to see this word faith comes through the whole book. Um, just remember again in chapter 1 verse 16, he says, for all those who believe in Jesus and receive eternal life. Uh, Paul was wanting to make these truths known so that people would actually believe. And what is at the heart of all that we are believing? Well, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. The price has been paid. God our Savior wants all people to be saved. He's made it possible th through Jesus for people to be saved. So Paul says, I'm going to tell people this truth and I'm going to call them to trust it. To trust that Jesus gave himself for people to achieve the salvation that God wants. I'll call people to come to know this truth. And so that their prayers will be shaped by this truth, so that their lives will be shaped by this truth, and that their words, too, would be shaped by this truth. And so this whole section pivoting around this gospel essential that the whole book pivots around should lead us to say that this truth, that Jesus saves us, must impact our prayers, our lives, and our words, so that others might be saved, which is what God wants. What does God want? Salvation. That is God's priority. It should be ours. We should want the world to know about Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for them. And then we should be praying that their lives would be transformed by that truth. And it would be heard in their prayers and their words and seen in their lives. 
So as you dig in further, I pray that this passage would stir your own heart, remind you of the gospel, cause you to rejoice in the gospel, and that as you teach it to others, um, be praying that this truth would indeed transform them, that it would impact their prayers and their lives and their words so that others would be saved, which is what God wants. Well, God bless as you dig in further. Thank you.